You're listening to Pre-Market Prep. I'm Brianna Valeski here with my co-host Joel Elkanen. We're joined by Adam Sarhan. He's the founder and CEO of Sarhan Capital. Adam, thanks for joining us. How are you doing on this Tuesday morning? Excellent. How are you? We are fantastic. It's bright and sunny here in Detroit, so we couldn't be any better. There was a Fed announcement last week, and you mentioned you felt like we are getting mixed signals in regard to the recovery of the economy right now. Do you want to expand on that for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So what's happening now in the first half of the year was we started with GDP in the first quarter as negative. And then Mm -hmm. GDP in the second quarter came in and missed estimates last week. We saw that GDP for the second quarter was 2.3% and that missed estimate was 2.6%. But then the the Fed changed, or the government, sorry, changed the way that they quote-unquote calculate GDP and they artificially raised the first quarter GDP from a net loss to a slight gain. Funny math, cook the books, whatever word you want to use, I'll let other people, you know, fill in that blank with however you want it. But really, the reality of the situation is that the market is telling us a complete different signal than what the Fed is telling us. And the signal completely contradicts the Fed's narrative that the economy will improve in the second half of the year. Now, let's just, before we talk about what the Fed's telling us, it's important to go back for a second and talk about what the Fed has been telling us for most of this year, if not late 14. The idea was is that the weakness in the first half of the year for 2015 for this year would be transitory, which is a euphemism for short term. And the economy would improve in the second half of the year. And therefore, the Fed remains data dependent. And if the economy improves, if the data improves, the Fed's going to go ahead and raise rates. Now, transportation stock, if you look at the IYT, which is the ETF that tracks the Dow trans- the transportation sector, that's in the correction territory, down double digits from its high in November. It peaked in November of 14, and it's been going you know, straight down since. When you have a group that that's that important as a transport, not just lagging, but in a correction area, that tells you that Main Street has a significant problem because the way the transportation stocks benefit is when more things or more stuff moves in the economy, whether it's people, it's goods, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first real major you know, thing that's changed or, or a negative divergence, if you will. The second major divert, negative divergence or, or change in script from what the Fed's been telling us is that Every, almost every single major commodity in the world, almost every single major one, except for, I believe, cattle, maybe cotton, and cocoa. Otherwise, every other major commodity are in bear market and or at least down for the last 12 months. So the other part of the dynamic that comes into play is China. China's stock market, we know that had a huge bubble because their government stepped up last year and really they did a Beijing put, which means they aggressively you know, injected the system, flooded the system with liquidity to prop up their stock market. Like any bubble, the bubble burst a month and change ago, and then all of a sudden they're now doing their best to curb the selling and, and, and stop the bleeding, so to speak. But you can't stop market forces. But the real problem for China is that China is an export-based economy, and the entire global economy is slowing and slowing significantly. Therefore, people are buying less things from China. And that's the fundamental problem that China faces, and by extension, the global economy faces. And since the U.S. is the largest economy in the world, we face it as well. So when we're buying less stuff from China because demand is slowing, transportation stocks are slowing down, the economic data isn't, isn't even beating expectations. Forget about growing and health and blah, blah. It's nowhere near that. So, you know, it begs or it raises the question: Why would the Fed possibly raise rates in September? They told us they're data dependent. Number one. Number two. I don't see one data point out there that suggests the Fed needs to raise rates. And number three, the Fed has a dual mandate. They have, you know, their dual mandate is to help the economy, help jobs, and also make sure inflation stays near two percent. Well, right now. Almost every major commodity in the world is in a bear market. Deflation is more of a threat than inflation. And we saw that last Friday with the wage, and we see that you know data after data, data point after data point, that deflation remains more of a threat than inflation. So really, but neither one of the Fed's two mandates are being met. 
So, and the data that they said that they're quote unquote data dependent, the data is not there to warrant a rate hike. So it, it, it boggles my mind. And Yellen's told us, told market participants, listen, I want you all to interpret the incoming data as if you were sitting on the board of the Fed, of the FOMC, and you make decisions as if you were, you guys were in our seats. She told one of the press conferences back earlier in the year. So, okay, I'm listening and I'm doing just that. I don't see how you can justify a se- now, it's, don't forget, it's not just one rate hike. Everyone's talking about when are they going to raise. It's a series of rate hikes. How can they begin raising rates with the economy contracting in the first quarter, or now it's barely growing? And you just have anemic growth across the board. The data's just not there to warrant raising rates. Plus, that's the first side of the equation. The second part of the dual mandate is these, you know, inflation is nowhere near the 2% target that they want. I mean, do you think they're ignoring certain data points or they're being just optimistic about the economy's uh, upturn? Or or do you think that the Fed feels pressured, like they feel like they have to put in at least some sort of rate hike this year? No, I think that there's a few things that are happening. Number one, Yellen and the Fed created the perfect hedge. And we wrote this to clients earlier as well and talked about this at length. And and basically, here's the underlying notion of what she's done brilliantly. She said, listen, the Fed's going to raise rates when the data improves. We're data dependent. Okay. Therefore, she has an out. She's hedged her bet, so to speak. If the data doesn't improve, the Fed doesn't have to raise rates. That's the first thing. So if you rewind the clock to January of this year, the narrative was, we're going to raise rates June or September. Well, June came and went, nothing happened. Now it's shifted to September or December. September's only a few weeks away. We're in August now. And the data hasn't improved enough to warrant a rate hike. So from where I sit, I, don't, I, I think the same thing is going to happen in September that happened in June. So by saying that she's data dependent, it's the perfect hedge. If the data improves, she'll raise rates. Now, conversely, if the data doesn't improve, she doesn't have to raise rates. Furthermore, if the data deteriorates and gets worse, I wouldn't put her past anybody over there at the Fed because they're all very, very dovish to enact another round of QE or printing of money and do QE for Really? And wow. that's the perfect hedge. I'm sorry? Oh, I, I said, wow, you, an, another round of QE? You think that's possible? If, the, if again, the, the, the major caveat here, the, the major and the imperative focus here is that if the data war, you know, if the data gets really weak, let's say Wall Street, you know, we've been in a six and a half year bull market now. Let's just say, God forbid, we enter a kinetic direction. You get double digit decline. The closest we got was last October, and then the QE trade, like Mohammed Alarian said, evolved, and then the Fed stopped QE3 in October of 14, the S&P fell 9.8%. And then all of a sudden, every other major central bank in the world announced some version of, of easy money. And boom, stocks shot right back up. So when, not, yeah, I was being a little bit um, sarcastic before, but when the market gets into a correction, you know, bull, every bull market in history begin, has a beginning and it ends. Eventually it ends, irrespective of what the Fed or other central banks or governments do. You know, it's just its normal cycle. So when this bull market eventually ends and the market decides to default, for lack of a better word, and then if that's coupled with a, a deceleration or just an outright contraction in growth, the data gets worse, you know, why would you not believe that they would do QE4? They did it three other times in the last five and a half, six years since the 09 low. If you look back, remember in 08, you had Lehman crisis and then the next QE1. Okay, right around March 09, the market bottomed, and QE1 was in place, and they were buying a boatload of bonds, and they were doing everything they can. And then it was a coordinated effort from other central banks as well. And in 09 to, you know, it was called the reflation trade. Then asset prices, mainly stocks, started going back up. Other commodities and other things as well reflated. That worked for 9, 10, and then all of a sudden QE1 ended, stocks fell. And then they announced QE2. Bernanke was out going to uh, Wyoming, the Jackson Hole, and boom, stocks took off again. They rallied nicely, and then after QE2 ended, what happened? It was a trivia question. Stocks fell again. And they, <laughs> fell almost, you know, they fell hard. And then, boom, they enacted QE3, September of 12. That wasn't enough. They doubled up again in December of 12, before the fiscal cliff and all that fun stuff. They doubled up their amount of buying, and then stocks soared for 13 and 14. And now in 15, we're moving sideways 
to consolidate that gain. The reason why U.S. stocks haven't fallen after QE3 ended so hard was because other central banks enacted their version of QE, which is printing of money and or easy money in some way, shape, or form, and that's caused that major bid in, in asset prices, specifically equity prices across uh, much of the world, but specifically our markets. Now, during that time, the entire five, you know six years or six and a half years that have passed, commodity prices, it stopped working. QE stopped working for commodity prices, and now we're seeing bear markets. And we're seeing major commodities, global commodities, trading like penny stocks. Look at crude oil. It's my favorite example. In the last year, crude fell 60% from June of 14 to March of 15. Okay, 60%. And then from March, the low in 2015, to the high, which was in May, right around 60 bucks or a little over 60, from, went from $42 a barrel to about 60 On a percent basis, that's almost a 50% rally in a few weeks. And then it sits near 60 for a few more weeks, a month or so. And then about six, seven weeks ago, all of a sudden, it begins rolling over again. And now it's down about 23% in the last seven weeks. So here's a major global commodity trading like a bank. If I told you, if I surveyed your audience, the favorite thing I do, I speak all the time to different crowds. And we go to the audience and say, listen, here's an asset. I'm not going to show you what it is. It fell 60% in a few months. It rallied 50%. And then it fell, it fell 22%. What do you think it is? A stock that was being sold on Wolf of Wall Street and you know some common penny stock that was just made up for Gazi for Gazi, or was it a is it a major global commodity like crude oil? And the answer is it's crude oil. You can't Hollywood can't make this script up, and that's the reality of the world we're living in today. Adam, and it's we, not just crude; it, it goes on and on and on. I def- yes. I want to get your take on some some of our just uh, specific issues before the internet's over. We've only got about five minutes left with you, um, Apple. Hitting this 118 level, what are your thoughts on the stock right now? I think in the intermediate term and longer term, Apple's very, very important break yesterday on a technical basis. It broke the 200-day moving average. It did on heavy volume. It's got a problem unless it can hold the old chart lows, which were right near 117. If it breaks down below there, more or less takes out yesterday's low, which was 117.52, I'd have to expect it to pull into the mid uh, 110, and then you know, retest that 105 to 100 area. But intermediate and longer term, the stock's got a problem, and that was because yesterday you had a big break. Now, if that break is repaired, the technical damage can quickly be repaired, and you see Apple back in the mid one, you know, 120s or somewhere above there, at least above the 200-day moving average. Then you could say, okay, you have another chance to move higher. But as of right now, it was a great leading stock, and the stock's in trouble. Twitter also, you know, breaking below the $30 level yesterday. What's your long and short-term thoughts on Twitter? Twitter is in a bear market. And even as the stock market is in, in a bullish market environment, lots of areas of the market are in their own private bear market. And Twitter is one of them. Twitter is a stock that's just gotten beaten down, hit an all-time low yesterday. It's not acting well at all. And by definition, the path of least resistance is down for Twitter until they're able to get their act together and realize, you know, get their story straight, so to speak. Investors need to like social media stocks again. The big takeaway from last quarter, earnings-wise, was that investors no longer like, pardon the pun, social media stocks. You saw Twitter, Yelp, and LinkedIn get hammered last quarter. Facebook was the only stock that was eh, just hanging in there. And then this quarter, once again, Twitter, Yelp, and LinkedIn all got hammered after reporting numbers and Facebook is, again, the leader of the pack. But the, the last two quarters, you know, investors are, are not liking, if that's even the right word, or unliking or unfriending social media stocks. I don't even know the right word. Unfriending. <laughs> media lingo, <but laughs> Unfollowing. You follow what I'm saying. Okay, let me get your take on Disney. We're expecting their earnings report later today. There's a ton of buzz. Your know, analysts are talking about the Star Wars movie coming out later this year. Have you been following Disney at all? Absolutely. Disney is a powerhouse. They fire on all cylinders. And I've got a three and a half year old daughter and she's in the Disney princess phase. And I can tell you (laughs) first, I live near Disney World in Orlando and we're there all the time. I had my family in town this past weekend. We went to Chef Mickey's Cafe and saw the characters and my little nephews and nieces are also in that, you know, two to five year old phase. We're in heaven. The place was packed. Lines are out the door. I have, and the stock is acting extremely well. In the short term, it's extended. I wouldn't be surprised to see it pull back a little bit. 
but the intermediate and longer term picture remains, you know, very, very strong for Disney. Uh, Tesla, we have to talk about Tesla. We're going to see their earnings report later this week. I mean, this is crazy stock moves on Elon Musk's tweets. You know, we're getting all sorts of sales numbers from the company. What are you looking for in Tesla? Sure. Full disclosure, we're long Tesla. We've been long for about a 30% gain here just recently. I did a purchase back in April. And what's happening here is that you see the stock had a very big run from the lows back in March and April of this year. And then now it's pulling back in to digest that move into the 50-day moving average. It's doing exactly what you expect a big stock to do. I don't like the fact that it's a little wide and loose up here, meaning you're having some volatility pick up. But again, this is a great company. They're innovative. They're a leader in their space. Nobody else does what they do. And that's huge. Even It's not a new story. The stock's been around for years. And nobody else, even the big automobile companies, they're not able to capture that electronic car audience. You know, even the Cadillac had their ELR come out. They tried doing it and other guys as well. But for whatever reason, they don't have the mass appeal that Tesla has. And they continue to innovate. They continue to do well. So long-term investors, even one bad quarter, two bad quarters, as long as they remain a leader in their space and continue to innovate and they're able to figure out that lower-cost car model and give the car to the masses, like what Apple did with the iPhone. At first, when the iPhone 1 came out, it was this elite thing and everybody had to have it. Next thing you know, they were able to create a device that was user-friendly and affordable, even though it's a very expensive phone, but you can do the payment plans, you know, et cetera. And now everybody's got an iPhone. So it's ubiquitous. If Tesla can follow that model and get an electric car in everyone's driveway, you know, Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it's a great strategy that Apple use. You create a product and then you make everyone want it before you create that really that price level that everyone can attain it for. So, all right, we've got a minute left with you, Adam. Final thoughts on the market right now for our traders and investors. Yeah, I would definitely say we're in an aging bull market for stocks. The good news is, is that even with all this quote-unquote negativity, we're still in the sideways trading range for the S&P 500, and the S&P is only 2.5%, 3% below an all-time high. A few good days, and boom, we can bust out of this range to the upside, and boom, we blast off. The, the market needs a bullish impetus, and we're in a wait-and-see approach right now, and, the mar- and investors continue to digest the latest round of earnings and economic data to see what the Fed's next move is going to be. But once we get that bullish impetus, we can easily break out to the upside. Now, conversely, if we don't get that bullish impetus and we see the market do what Apple just did and break down below these important areas of support, then really look out for further downside because we're way overdue. We've been on the line with Adam Sarhan. He's the founder and CEO of Sarhan Capital. He joins us at the beginning of every month to share his take on the market. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and we'll talk to you again at the beginning of next month. Thank you.